Therefore, I pressed on and in two days arrived at a wretched hamlet on the seashore. He inquired of the inhabitants concerning the fiend and gave accurate information. A gigantic monster, they said, had arrived the night before, armed with a gun, many pistols, put into flight the inhabitants of one of the solitary cottages through fear of his terrific appearance. He carried off their store of winter food, placing it in a sledge. So we learned the creature has a sledge, which he'd seized on numerous drove of trained drog, dogs. So he seizes some trained dogs and harnesses them. And the same night, to the joy of the villagers, he pursues his journey and leaves. He goes across the sea in the direction of the North Pole. They guessed he will be destroyed by the breaking of the ice or the frozen in the eternal frosts. On hearing this information, I suffered a temporary access of despair. He would escaped me, and I must commence a destructive and almost endless journey across the mountainous ices of the ocean amidst cold that few of the inhabitants could long endure, and which I, coming from a genial and sunny climate, could not hope to survive. The idea that the fiend should live and be triumphant, my rage and vengeance returned, and like a mighty fiend overwhelmed every other feeling. After a slight rest, during which the spirits of the dread hovered round, I prepared. So he calls him to toil and eventually prepares. He exchanges his land sledge for one that's going to suit the frozen ocean. He purchases stock of provisions. I departed. I cannot guess how many days have departed since. I've endured misery with nothing but the eternal sentiment of just retribution burning within my heart. Immense and rugged mountains of ice often barred my passage. Heard the thunder of the ground sea, which threatened my destruction. Frost came and made the paths of the sea secure. By the quantity of provisions which I've consumed, I, I would guess I, I passed three weeks in this journey. And continually protection of hope returns back upon the heart, often rings bitter drops of despondency and grief from my eyes. Despair has almost succeeded to my prey. And I would soon have sunk beneath this misery. Once after the poor animals that had conveyed me had with incredible toil, I've drawn a picture of dogs pulling a sledge up a hill, gained the summit of a sloping ice mountain, one sinking under tiredness, one of the dogs dies. I viewed the expanse with anguish. He's about to be, he's desperately sad. And my eyes dark speck on the dusty plain. I strained my eyes to discover what it could be. I uttered a wild cry of ecstasy when I distinguished a sledge and the stocked proportions of a well-known form within. What oh, with burning gush did my hope revisit my heart. Warm tears filled my eyes, which I hastily wiped away. They might in not intercept the view I had of the demon, but my sight was dimmed with the burning drops, giving way to emotions that oppressed me, and I wept aloud. This was not the time for delay. I disencumbered the dogs of their dead companion, gave them a plentiful portion of food, and after an hour's rest, which was absolutely necessary, but bitterly irksome to me, I continued my route. Seize the creature. Across the ice. I gained on it, and when, after nearly two days' journey, I beheld my enemy at no more than a mile distance, miles distance, and my heart bound within me. But now, when I had appeared almost within my grasp, my foe suddenly extinguished and I lost all trace of him. So they're close and then they're far. They're close and they're far. The ground sea was heard. Now this is important. And suddenly the wind arose, the sea roared, and as with a mighty shock of earthquake, the ice splits. I've got here a picture of the ice splitting. And he's now on his sledge on an ice raft. The tumultuous sea rolled between me and my enemy and I was left drifting on a scattered piece of ice that was continually lessening, melting, preparing me for a hideous death. In this manner, many appalling hours passed. Several of my dogs died and I saw I was about to sink. Under the accumulation of distress, suddenly he sees Walton. He sees his ship. We're back at the beginning. I had no conception the vessels ever came so far north. I was astounded by the sight. I quickly destroyed my part of the sledge to construct oars. And by this means was enabled with infinite tiredness, fatigue, to move my ice raft in the direction of your ship. 
I determined, if you were going southwards, still to trust myself to the mercy of the seas, then abandon my purpose. I hope to persuade you to grant me a boat with which to pursue my enemy. By your direction, but your direction was northward. You took me on board when my vigour was exhausted, and I would have sunk under my multitude hardships into a death which I still dread, for my task is unfulfilled. Key quotation, hubris overreaching Walton. And he's persuasive, almost manipulative. Oh, with my guiding spirit conducting me to the demon, allow me to rest so much I desire. Or must I die and yet he live? If I do, swear to me, Walton, that he shall not escape and you shall seek him and satisfy my vengeance in his death. And do I dare to ask you to undertake my pilgrimage and endure the hardships which I have undergone? No, I am not so self. <laughs> Yet, when I am dead, if he should appear, if the ministers of vengeance shall conduct him to you, swear he shall not live, swear that he shall not triumph over my accumulated woes and survive to add to the list of his dark crimes. He is eloquent and persuasive, and once his words had even the power over my heart, but trust him not, he quotation. His soul is as hellish as his form, full of treachery and fiend like a malice. Hear him not. Call on the names of William Justine Clerval, Elizabeth, my father, and the wretched victor, and thrust your sword into his heart. I will hover near and direct the steel aright. Abhuman. He says, I'm not going to call you to continue with my, my, my pilgrimage, but, but uh, if you do see him continue with my pilgrimage. Yeah, does that make sense? What do we think about Frankenstein at this point? Ten seconds, ten. Good, let's carry on. You have read this strange and terrific story, Margaret, and do you not feel your, wait for it, blood, congeal with horror like that which now even curdles mine? Curdles the blood, quickens the beating of the heart. Nothing like a bit of gothic, 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 liminality, abhuman. Phantasmagoria, haunted, age of enlightenment, critique of. Yeah, all the stuff we've learned comes together. Sometimes he's with agony, he couldn't continue his tale, and others his voice broken yet, piercing uttered with the difficulty of words so replete with anguish. His fine and lovely eyes, now lighted with indignation, subdued to sorrow, quenched with infinite wretchedness. Sometimes he commands his countenance with tones, relates the most horrible incidents with tranquil voice. Then he's like a volcano bursting forth. His face changes to wildest rage and he shrieks out imprecations upon his persecutor. His tale is connected. Walton says it's all true and told with an appearance of simplest truth. Yet I own to you that the Felix of the letters of Felix and Safi, he's shown me. Verisimilitude, yeah? And the apparition of the monster I've seen from the ship have brought a greater conviction. Nothing like a bit of verisimilitude. To add to the realism for the audience of the time of the 19th century, horrifyingly possible. This critique of the Enlightenment have brought a greater conviction to the truth of his narrative. However earnest and connected, such a monster then has real existence. I can't doubt it, yet I'm lost in surprise and admiration. Sometimes I'm in, I endeavour to gain from Frankenstein the particulars of the uh, creature's formation. <laughs> but on that point, he was impenetrable. Are you mad, my friend? He said, oh, or whither does your senseless curiosity lead you? Would you also create for yourself a demoniacal enemy? Peace, peace. Learn my miseries. And do not seek to increase your own. He says he's giving us a warning. Frankenstein discovered that I made notes. He asked to see them. He corrects and adds to them, augmented. He gives life and spirit to the conversations that he had with his enemy. You've preserved my narration. I don't want it mutilated. I don't want it ruined. I want it to be truthful, to go down for posterity. A week has passed while I've listened to the strangest tale. My thoughts and feelings have been drunk up by the interest of my guest. I wish to soothe him, 
to counsel him. And I want him to live. Oh, no. The only joy he says he can experience now is when he experiences peace and death. He enjoys one comfort, which is dreams. He holds conversation with his friends. He thinks they give him consolation in his misery. The beings visit him from the regions of the remote world and they give him faith. He then says that Frankenstein seems to have unbound knowledge. It's eloquent. So he's visited, haunted by phantasmagoria, gothic dreams, abhuman, liminality. Between human and death. Gothic. When he relate now, this is the one I, I would say this page down to um, where it repulses the idea is one of the most important pages of the novel. Okay, so on where it goes down to repulses the idea is really really important. Key page. What a glorious creature he must have been in the days of his prosperity, because he's so noble and godlike in ruin. God, Prometheus, fall, Lucifer. When younger, he said he, I believed myself destined for some great enterprise. My feelings are profound. I had a coolness of judgment, which fit, was fitting for illustrious achievements, for impressive achievements. The sentiment of the worth of my nature supported me when others would have been oppressed. I deemed it criminal. I thought it would be criminal to throw away in useless grief those talents that might be useful. Overreacher. He doesn't think about whether he should. And this is a question in both texts about morality. Both novels question the morals of scientific pursuit. Both novels question the morals of scientific pursuit. There wasn't time to ask the sensible questions, it says in Never Let Me Go. There wasn't time. Requiring students to donate. There wasn't time. They wanted you back in the shadows, shadowy objects in test tubes. They shuddered to think of that. Yeah? Yeah? In Never Let Me Go, Cures for the Diseases. In Frankenstein, because he's got the ability, he does overreach a critique of the Enlightenment. We could not write an essay without talking about overreachers. We could not write an essay without talking about Gothic. We cannot write an essay without talking about overreachers, responsibility and the outworkings of the lack thereof. Lack of responsibility. He thinks it's criminal to throw away his talent. When I reflected on the work I'd created, completed, no lesser one than the creation of a sensitive and rational animal, I could not rank myself with the herd of common projectors. I managed to create a sensitive and rational animal. I'm not ordinary. Wait, 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 wait. You said this was going to be a warning. He's still proud. He's still hubristic. But also, yes, he created a sensitive and rational animal. But he didn't care for it. He wasn't a parent. He wasn't kind like the guardians. The difference. Look at how the clones turn out. They are able to be kind, loving, create art, make friendships. Have life. Albeit brief. Creature? Responsibility is key. In Kathy telling her story, she accepts. She gives hope to other clones, doesn't she? She gives other clones 
Hailsham. She gives others a good life. Do you want to write this on a piece of paper? By Kathy telling her story, she gives a story. She accepts mono noare. She accepts her human condition. Appreciating the transience of life, the brevity. She gives hope to other clones. I don't know how it was where you were. She gives us Hailsham. She gives us a good life, rhubarb patch, care, pencil cases, art. Sharing, appreciation. All because of care and kindness in upbringing. This is a curiously positive tale. Humans are being, human beings are capable of caring deeply for one another. Even Madame and Miss Emily, they put away their revulsion. Whereas for Victor, continued hubris, continued vengeance, continued unhappiness. And his creature is bound in this. Mistreated, outsider, aboard, hated, aborted creation is how he's described. Monster, fiend, devil. Because of Frankenstein's master scientist behaviours. It's so different, these ends. One, hope and acceptance. And the other, gothic, hubristic, overreach to the end. Good. This supports him. All my speculations and hopes are nothing. I, like Lucifer, Paradise Lost, like the archangel who aspired to omnipotence, I am chained in an eternal hell. But it's of his own making. He was God. He wasn't Lucifer. He was God. I executed the creation of a man. I trod heaven in my thoughts, exulting in my powers, and now burning with the ideas of their effects. From my infancy, infancy I was imbued with high hopes and lofty ambition, but oh, I'm sunk. Oh, friend, if you'd known me as I once was, you would not recognize me in this state of degradation. Despondency rarely visited my heart. High destiny seemed to bear on me until I never, ever rised again. Must I lose this admirable being? I've longed for a friend, someone to sympathize and love me. On this desert seas, I have found such a one, but I fear gained him only to know his value and lose him. I would want him to live, to reconcile himself to life, but he repulses the ideas. I thank you, Walter your kind intentions towards a miserable wretch. But when you speak of new ties, fresh affections, none can replace those that are gone. Clerval, any other woman could be Elizabeth. They have a certain, those always have a certain power over our minds. Frankenstein he says he can have no more friends. And he talks about having no more friends. He hears the voice of Elizabeth further down. The conversation of Clerval always whispered in my ear, they are dead. But they preserve my life as I'm engaged in this undertaking. I must pursue and destroy the being whom I gave my existence. Then my lot on earth will be fulfilled and I may die. We've got a sudden change here. Sudden change. They are in danger. Most are practical. 
I wrote to you encompassed by peril and ignorant if I will ever see dear England and the dearer friends that inhabit it. I'm surrounded by mountains of ice. No, admit no escape. And threaten every moment to crush my vessel. The brave fellows who I persuaded to be my companions look towards me for aid. But I've got none to bestow. So the mariners look to him for help. There's something appalling in our situation. My courage and hopes don't desert me, but it's terrible to reflect that all of the lives of these men are endangered through me. He does actually take responsibility. He is different. He says, if we are lost, my mad schemes are the cause. Walton does have more. I'm so sorry about my awful handwriting. Walton does have more responsibility than Victor. He recognises it's his mad schemes. And what, Margaret, will be the state of your mind? You won't hear of my destruction. You'll wait anxiously for my return. Years will pass. You'll have visitings of despair and yet be tortured by hope. Oh, beloved sister, the sickening of your heart expectations is more terrible to me than my own death. But you've got a husband, lovely children. You may be happy. Heaven bless you and make you so. Has Walton learned? Has Walton learned? My unfortunate guest regards me with the tenderest compassion. He talks about life as a possession which he values. He says lots of accidents have happened to other navigators. He fills me with cheerful auguries. The sailors feel the power of his eloquence. He sees the ice mountains as just molehills and he dreads a mutiny. Underline that. A scene has just passed of uncommon interest. That, although it's highly probable these papers may never reach you, I cannot forbear recording it. We are still surrounded by mountains of ice and in imminent danger of being crushed. The cold is excessive. This is all rhyme with the ancient mariner. Right, becalmed. When they were becalmed in the ice. Frankenstein declines, feverish fire glimmers in his eyes, he's exhausted, he's almost lifelessness. I mentioned in my last letter, I feared mutiny. This morning, as I sat watching the wan countenance, the pale face of my friend, his eyes half closed, his limbs hanging lifelessly, I was roused by half a dozen of the sailors who demanded admission into the cabin. They entered. And their leader addressed me. He told me him and his companions have been chosen by the other soldiers to come in deputation to me to make a requisition, a request, which I could not refuse. We were inured by ice and would probably never escape. But they fear if the ice would dissipate and free us from the ice, I should be rash enough to continue and lead them into fresh dangers. After they might happily have surmounted this, they insisted, therefore, I engage them with a solemn promise that if the vessels freeze, we would go instantly speech troubled me. I had not despaired, and I had conceived the idea of returning if set free. I had not thought of it. Could I, with justice or possibility, refuse? I hesitated before I answered. While Frankenstein, who had been silent, who barely seemed to have force to attend, roused himself. His eyes sparkled. His cheeks flushed with a momentary vigour. Turning towards them, he said, What do you mean? What do you demand of your captain? Are you so easily turned? From your design? Did you not call this a glorious expedition? Why was it glorious? Not because it was smooth and placid as the southern sea, but because it was full of dangers and terror. And now in every new incident, your fortitude was to be called upon for. Your courage, because danger and death surrounded it, and you were brave and overcome. It was a glorious undertaking, honourable. You would be hailed as benefactors of your species, your names adored, as belonging to brave men who encounter death for honour, benefit of mankind. And now, behold, with the first imagination of danger, with the first mighty terrific trial of your courage, you shrink away and are content to be handed down as men who had not strength enough to endure cold and peril. Poor souls who were chilly, 
return to their warm firesides. Why? That doesn't require preparation. You should not have come so far and dragged yourself for the shame of defeat. Merely to prove yourself, coward. Oh, be men, or more than men. Be steady to your purposes, firm as a rock. The ice is not made of such stuff as your hearts. It's mutable, cannot withstand you. And if you say it shall not, do not return to your families with the stigma of disgrace marked on your brows. Return as heroes who have fought and conquered and who know not what it is to turn their backs on the foe. 20 seconds, write down what are the key elements of his speech. So hubris, overreacher, he's failed to learn like Prometheus, an overreacher, like God, but a God that does not care for his creation. He spoke with a voice so modulated to the different feelings expressed in his speech and with an eye so full of lofty design and heroism. Can you wonder they were moved? They looked at one another and were unable to reply. I spoke, I told them to retire, consider what had been said. I would not lead them farther north if they desired the contrary, but I hoped their courage would return. They retired. I turned towards my friend. He sunk in languor, almost deprived of life. How all this will terminate, I don't know. But I'd rather die than return shamefully. Is that not exactly what Frankenstein did all the way through? He didn't return to his family because he wanted to pursue his aims. Yes. Bolton was talking about how he thought, how bad Elizabeth would feel if he didn't return. Yes, so, yeah. exactly, it's exactly. He's passing his own, kind of um, paralleling his own overreaching, teaching the mariners to follow his path. It's not a warning at all. I can never willingly to conjure uh, the hardship. The die is cast. Rhyme of the ancient mariner, dice. <coughs> Dieth, l death, life and death. I've consented to return if we're not destroyed. So he is, Walton is different. My hopes are blasted by cowardice and indecision. I come back, it, well, he still wants, you know, still hubristic, isn't he? He's still sad that he has to be a coward and go home. I possess to bear this injustice with patience. It's past, I'm returning to England. I've lost hopes of utility and glory. I've lost my friend, so we know he's dead. But I will endeavour to detail these bitterest circumstances to you, my dear sister, while I'm wafted towards England. I will not despond. On September the 9th, the ice began to move, roarings like thunder at a distance, islands split and cracked in every direction. We were in the most imminent peril, but we could only remain passive. My unfortunate guest, his illness increased. He's entirely confined to his bed. The ice cracked, driven with force towards the north, a breeze springs from the west, they're saved, and on the 11th, the passage towards the south became perfectly free. The sailors saw this, and their, that their return to the native country was apparently assured. Joy broke from am among them, loud and continued. Frankenstein, who was dozing, awoke and asked the cause. They shout, I said, because it will soon return to England. <coughs> Do you then really return? Alas, I cannot withstand their demands. I cannot lead them unwillingly to danger. And I must return. Do so if you will, but I will not. You may give up your purpose, but mine is assigned by heaven and I dare not. I'm weak, but the spirits that assist my vengeance will endow me with sufficient strength. Saying this, he endeavoured to spring from the bed, but the exertion was too great. He fell back and fainted. It was long before he was restored, and I thought his life was entirely extinct. But at length he opened his eyes and breathed, but was unable to speak. The surgeon gave him a composing draught and ordered us to leave him undisturbed. In the meantime, he told me that my friend had not many hours to live. The sentence was pronounced. I could only grieve and be patient. I sat by his bed, watching him. His eyes were closed, and I thought he slept. But presently he called me in a feeble voice, bidding me to come near, said, Alas, the strength that I relied on is gone. I feel I shall soon die, and he, my enemy and persecutor may still be in a being. 
Think not, Walton, that in the last moments of my being I feel burning hatred or revenge. I do feel myself, yeah, I feel myself justified in desiring the death of my adversary. So in his final moments, he comes round to justify himself. I have been examining my past conduct, nor do I find it blamable. Hubris. He hasn't learned. He justifies himself. In a fit of enthusiastic madness, I created a rational creature. It wasn't a fit of enthusiastic. It was nine months. Dabbled in the unarmed dance of the grave. Pursued nature to hiding places. Taught to the living animal that might animate lifeless clay. And then he says, I was bound towards him to, ins to assure, to make sure as far as was in my power, his happiness and well-being. But he didn't. This was my duty. Is it humble? Does he have a moment of realisation and agonisis or not? He says, this was my duty, but there was another greater. My duty towards the beings of my own species. He says, I had responsibility towards my creature, but my greater responsibility was towards humanity. And yet he didn't care for his creature. He wasn't kind. He wasn't, he didn't give him an upbringing. He wasn't a parent. He wasn't actually a Prometheus. He was not like Prometheus. He did not care for his being. Prometheus, in the second myth, Gave humanity gifts, skills, intellect, abilities. Frankenstein did nothing. Yes. If he really paid attention, he would know that if he hurt humans, he helped us have the future. Yes. So he didn't actually like To that. actually do his duty towards humanity, he would have cared for his creature. If he had done his duty towards humanity like the guardians do he would have cared for his creation his child his new species the guardians do Urged by this view, I refused, and did right in refusing, to create the companion for the first creature. He showed unparalleled malignity and selfishness. In evil, he destroyed my friends. He devoted to destruction, being soon possessed exquisite sensations, happiness, wisdom. And I don't know where this thirst for vengeance may end. Miserable himself, he may render, he may render no other wretched, wretched he ought to die. This task was mine, but I failed. I ask you to undertake my unfinished work and I renew this request now. When I'm induced by reason and virtue, I do it because I'm reasonable and good. Really? I can't ask you to renounce your country and friends, but if you have a meeting with him, consider these points, think about your duty, I leave you I don't ask you to do it, but he does ask him to do it, yeah? Whether he's uh, lives to be an instrument of mischief disturbs me. I expect to be released, so he expects to die. This is the only happy experience he's had for a while. He sees the beloved before him, flits, and he hastens to their arms. Farewell, Walton. Seek happiness in tranquility. Ha! Huh. Avoid ambition. Even if it's only apparently innocent. Even if it seems only in apparent innocence of distinguishing yourself in science and discovery. Yeah. Yet why do I say this? Because I have been blasted in these hopes. Yet another may succeed. So he tried. He says he tries to be tranquil. Did he? Did he ever experience peace, acceptance? 
His voice became faint and at length exhausted by the effort he sunk into silence. About half an hour after he attempts to speak but was unable, he pressed my hand feebly, his eyes closed forever. Irradiation of his gentle lips passed away on his lips. Margaret, how can I speak about this glorious spirit? What can I say? All I would express would be inadequate and feeble. My tears flow. My mind is overshadowed by a cloud of disappointment. But I journey towards England and I may there find consolation. Okay. Except one that's slightly less hubristic. I'm interrupted. What do these sounds portend? It's midnight. The breeze blows fairly. The watch on deck scarcely stirs. Oh, okay. That's a sound of a human voice, but hoarse. It comes from a cabin. Oh, amazing. Frankenstein's still there. I must arise and examine. Good night, my sister. Great God! What a scene is just taking place. I'm dizzy with the remembrance of it. I hardly know that I'll have the power to detail it, yet the tale I've recorded will be incomplete without this final and wonderful catastrophe. I enter the cabin, where lay the remains of my ill-fated and admirable friend. Overhang her form, I cannot find the words to describe. Gigantic in stature, uncouth, distorted in its proportions. He hung over the coffin, his face concealed by long locks of ragged hair. Wait for it, Michelangelo and God, yeah? Michelangelo, God and Matt, oh, sorry.